Thank you very much, uh, Anka, again for this very nice introduction and um, and for the possibility uh, to speak to you here. Um, so you can see the topic of my uh, second talk, the Mediterranean mental mapping and historical context along Dure perspective. This is a topic, uh, as uh, Anka has just been explaining, which uh, found my interest for quite a long time, especially focusing on this uh, issue in a, in a larger context, combining different disciplines, what we call classics, what we called um, ancient Eastern studies, and also in a, in a, in a wider framework. <clears throat> so I am going to structure uh, my talk in four, ste in four steps, as you can see here uh, behind me. I, uh, the first step will uh, give you a general uh, introduction, a little bit uh, focusing on the context, especially the ancient Near Eastern contexts, which are somehow important um, <clears throat> for my approach. Uh, the second is, uh, I call it the Mediterranean before the Mediterranean, that means before the, the, this uh, sea has been labeled as Mediterranean, which continues the overview in the third and second millennia BC. And uh, the third uh, part will directly move into the general topic of this talk. Um, uh, in my opinion, a crucial period, uh, the seventh century BC, conceptualizing the Mediterranean in the seventh century, as I would uh, put it. And then <clears throat> finally, uh, I will try to draw a conclusion, putting uh, the evidence uh, together. So I start with this very first. Um, a chapter, the Mediterranean mental mapping and historical context. And neglected history means, of course, as Anka has been explaining, that generally this approach is not so much familiar to ancient Eastern studies, I would say. So let's start. Uh, studies on the history of the sea have come into vogue in recent decades, as all of you know. Publications on seafaring, shipbuilding, nautical matters, explorations, connectivity, trade and entrepreneurship have sprung up like mushrooms in the last two decades. In ancient studies, the Indian Ocean has become a central focus on research and the Persian Gulf attracts more and more attention. And Anka has also worked on these issues, of course. The Black Sea has become a key area for the study of Greek colonization. The same is true for the Mediterranean, where what we call Phoenician, the term is not without problems, as you know, where Phoenician exploration of the West adds an additional dimension to the issue. Although studies in the prehistory of seafaring gain more and more importance, and there is an ever-increasing awareness of the relevance of shipping links in the late Bronze Age, especially second half of the second millennium BCE, recent scholarship agrees that seafaring and exploration of the Mediterranean attained a new dimension in the first millennium BC. This trend started already very early in the, uh, mil uh, very early in the, um, in the millennium when Euboean, Cypriot and Levantine mariners not only establish new forms of connectivity in the Eastern Mediterranean, but simultaneously began to gradually advance into the Western Mediterranean as well. <clears throat> Southern Spain uh, is of course very important here. After years of intensive research, we are able to reconstruct these developments at least in broad lines. We know that trade with raw materials as well as with luxuries played a major role, that foreign trading hubs were hotspots of trends and interregional contacts, that, that we have to take into consideration international and multilingual crews, and that the spread of cultural techniques loomed large in these contexts. One attendant of this East-West movement was the spread of the idea of the alphabet in multiple variants and local transformations that captivated the entire Mediterranean. The Greek alphabets in the plural, the Phrygian alphabet, the Etruscan alphabet, the Latin alphabet, and what we call the Tartessian alphabet are intriguing testimonies for this cultural drift 
and its ongoing reinvention and reconstructions, with highlighting reinventions and reconstructions, of course. Also, the chronological setting for these processes has become reasonably clear, with the Phoenician presence at Huelva around the turn of the 10th to the 9th century BC, the, the entire Mediterranean started more and more to become an entity of its own right. This had tremendous repercussions on the mantle maps of the agents involved in these processes directly and indirectly. It is interesting to note that recent research has not really devoted much energy to examining this interesting field in a process of dynamic change. Whereas investigations in the histories of networks has become a common trend, the genesis of the mantle mapping of the Mediterranean is not. This becomes immediately obvious when one looks in relevant handbooks and encyclopedias. There is much about geography and history, but little about the development of the mantle mapping of what, we to, of what we today call the Mediterranean. There are plenty of studies indeed on the naming of the sea, most of them based on Greek and Roman sources. Moreover, there has always been a sort of awareness that the Odyssey is an important witness for this new mental reconfiguration of a somehow united Mediterranean. But this has not been put into a larger framework. This is astonishing since it is obvious that the concept of the, the Mediterranean as a sui generis entity is a mental construct that can only be explained in a historical setting that made this specific space tangible and accessible in an entirely new way where connectivity and entanglement loomed large. Apparently, the first half of the first millennium is a splendid candidate for this setting. But what about the extant sources for these mental reconfigurations? There are indeed some important testimonies to approach this issue that shed considerable light on this development, all of them, however, of ancient Near Eastern origin. All of them has so far not have so far not attracted the interest they deserve for the early history of the mantle mapping of the Mediterranean. One of them played a certain role at least in the discussion about the reconstruction of Mediterranean toponyms. Others have been neglected totally. So before we start discussing these important testimonies, a short introduction on the earliest sources on the Mediterranean seems to be appropriate. So now we move towards chapter two, the Mediterranean before the Mediterranean, a short overview of the mantle mapping of the upper sea and the lower sea in the third and second millennia BC. Starting with the third millennium BC, ancient Eastern empires conceptualized their claim to rule the entire world by a mantle map that determined the boundaries of this world as the upper sea and the lower sea. The space between these two oceans was taken to represent the world, substantiated as a mantle construct that was under the sway of legitimate Mesopotamian kings from early on. Obviously, the entire, the, obviously the center of this worldview was thought to be somewhere in Mesopotamia. From a modern perspective, both oceans are easily to identify. The upper sea represents what we nowadays call the Mediterranean. The lower sea is the Persian Gulf. So this is just a view on the, on this, um, on the land, political landscape of the third millennium BCE. On the one hand, it is reasonable, reasonable to take the available cuneiform evidence as the earliest testimonies for the designation of both the Mediterranean and the Persian Gulf. On the other hand, such an equation is not without problems. 
This becomes immediately apparent when we do not simply adjust these toponyms to our modern geographical conceptions, but place them within their respective worldviews. By doing so, we immediately realize that we are dealing with geographical perceptions as social constructions. Ours as well as the ancient ones that are part of mental configurations of the world. In such a context, the differences between these worldviews gain momentum. According to the Mesopotamian perspective, the upper sea was neither an entity nor a center, nor a center uh, a, a, or let's say a world of its own. It was not surrounded by land, but it was a liminal zone of the ancient Eastern world, a zone representing an ultimate border. It was part of an infinite ocean that surrounded and framed the known world. This world is very well documented by the so-called Babylonian map of the world of the first millennium BCE. So here you see this uh, Babylonian map of the world, the, the Okeanos, so to say, the, which surrounds the world, and Euphrates and Babylon in the center of this, uh, of this world. So it's uh, Babylon-centric, of course. However, this perception was not a stable one, and with the ongoing enlargement of geographical horizons, it had to be adapted and reconfigured again and again. Two substantial changes already occurred in the third millennium. They are both related to the lower sea, and they are of extraordinary relevance concerning the changing worldview of this time. It was in the third millennium BCE that the idea of the sea started to become structured and more organized for the first time. This happened by locating lands and territories in the midst of the sea, in the center of the sea. These regions may have mainly been thought as islands since they were reached by ships. However, it is evident that the phrase in the midst of the sea was also applied as a long distance marker that determines space and travel time. The earliest indication of this terminology originates in the inscriptions of Naramsin, king of Agade. So um, here in the second line you have him. You see it's in the last third of the third millennium BCE. So Naramsin, king of Agade, which is only preserved in an old Babylonian transcription, so about 300, uh, 350 years later. Um, there the king recounts, among other issues, how he conquered the land of Magan, located somewhere in the region of what we nowadays call Oman. So um, I just quote the text, which you can see behind me. Um, I quote the translation. Further he, that is Naramsin, crossed the lower sea and conquered Magan in the midst of the sea and washed his weapons in the lower sea. End of quote. The abstract extension of the geographical concept lower sea deserves our special attention. It aligned along the king's claim that he and his troops crossed the sea and that he conquered areas beyond this very sea. In this concept, imperial claim and a growing mantle map go hand in hand. The sea is not anymore a definite border, but an area to be crossed, conquered, and explored. This extension becomes even more apparent, uh, already apparent, with Naramsin's direct uh, uh, successor, Manish Dushu. In one of his inscriptions, um, in one of his inscriptions, he informs us how he had a special type of ships, which we do not really know how to read this uh, Sumerogram, Skishla E ships, traverse the lower sea. Um, as, and uh, you see the text again, just behind me, these ships traverse the lower sea as, uh, then the text, the cities across the sea assembled for battle against him, but he was victorious over them. Further, he, he conquered their cities and struck down their rulers." End of quote. 
As the king reveals in the following passage, there was also an economic aspect in this venture. And this is the, these are the last two lines now behind me. I quote, it, I quote them again. He queried black stone of the mountains across the lower sea, loaded it on ships, and moored the ships at the quay of Agade. End of quote. Obviously, the black stone refers to diorite, which indicates that the regions beyond the lower sea was in fact the region of Magan, nowadays Oman, which is rich in this kind of stone. It is not by accident that the mantle structuring of a world beyond the ocean started with the lower sea. Already in the third millennium, sea trade between Mesopotamia and India loomed large, stimulated economic growth, and boosted social reconfigurations. It is no surprise that Naramsin also mentioned the regions beyond the Lower Sea when he described the great revolt that ch challenged his rule, so a kind of great rebellion. So this is the next text, which again you see behind me, I just read it again, uh, quote it. Uh, when the four quarters of the world together revolted against him, this is Naramsin, from beyond the Lower Sea as far as Upper Sea he smote the people and all the mountain lands for the god Enlil, and brought their kings in fetters before the god Enlil." End of quote. So far, the early mantle structuring of the ocean only concerned the lower sea. There was nothing comparable beyond the upper sea, but times changed in the course of the second millennium BCE. On the one hand, the Mediterranean started to become the Great Sea, tamtum rabitum in Akkadian terminology. On the other hand, Cyprus appeared as Alasia on the scene in textual sources from the 19th century BC onwards at the latest. Comparatively rich documentation stems from Old Babylonian Mari, where Alasia is characterized as a place of origin of copper and bronze. The documentation for the island increases considerably in the second half of the second millennium. Just to give you an example, of testimonies of which we have um, uh, in the uh, in the Amana letters, uh, and uh, these texts refer uh, to, for, to Hatti, Egypt, Ugarit, and and Alalar. Sources from Ugarit and Egypt developed a perspective that reached as far as the Aegean, as you can see uh, behind me whereas Hittite sources began to take into account the westernmost part of Asia Minor and by referring to Achiava, the Greek mainland beyond. Although the Eastern Mediterranean lost more and more its character as a terra incognita, the conception of the sea as a liminal, as a liminal and indefinite zone did not really change. Thus, according to imperial mantle maps, the upper sea still represented a cosmological borderline. This is evident with the testimonies of the Middle Assyrian Empire, so again, second half of the second millennium BCE, which mainly extended along an east-west axis that reached from the Iranian mountains as far as the Mediterranean. The upper sea was integrated within this imperial perspective and still continued to, to yield the notion of a liminal zone. However, this zone was no longer totally repellent, but became open for penetration and intrusion. Therefore, it is no surprise that the uh, Assyrian king Tiglath Pileser I, so around 1100 BCE, we encounter the first ancient Near Eastern king who traveled out into the Mediterranean on a boat to hunt a Nahiru, which is supposed to be a kind of whale. So we do not exactly know what kind of fish or what kind of animal this Nahiru is, but probably this is a whale. Near Assyrian times saw a further extension of such sorts of adventurous performance, and the frontier zone was more and more presented as an area accessed by Near Assyrian kings. So here I have a a few on the, uh, on the Near Assyrian Empire. 
It was also in this time of an ever-growing worldview that the Mediterranean became the Great Sea of the West, whereas the Persian Gulf was designated as the Sea of Chaldea. And Chaldea is just a terminology for southern Babylonia. With Tiglat Pileser III, again you see behind me, we are in the 8th century now, BCE, considerable change took place again. He incorporated the Levantine coast into his ever-growing empire, thus also expanding his imperial claims towards new dimensions. In one of his summary inscriptions, he presents himself, uh, you have it just behind me, he presents himself as the king, um, first line, quote, who rules all lands from the heaven's foundations to their canopy and who has exercised the authority of a king upon them, end of quote. The two vertices, the two central um, uh, toponyms, uh, horizon, Ishi Chame in Akkadian and Zenith, Ela Chame in Akkadian, appropriately represent the claim to hold sway over the universe. At least in an indirect way, the ocean once again makes an appearance as an indefinite border with the intention to extend Assyrian rule into an unknown but simultaneously visible distance. With Sargon II, so we are now in the, uh, in the late 8th century BC, Sargon II, neo Assyrian king, Sargon II, a new area of structuring the sea started. The, the borders of the world were marked by two islands, that is Cyprus and Dilmun, which is Bahrain, in a kind of parallel composition. Both islands, Cyprus and Bahrain, remote as they were, Lay far, away, uh, lay far away in the midst of the sea. With this conception, the structuring of the upper sea gained momentum. Obviously, it was not the Assyrian kings who were the spearheads of this dramatic change of perspective, but Levantine cities like Tyre and Sidon that started to explore the West. But these cities gradually came under Assyrian control during the second half of the 8th century BC, as we have just been seeing. The Assyrian kings imposed taxes and tolls and installed Assyrian officials in a series of Levantine cities to supervise the local vessels and their revenues. It was this combination of direct and indirect rule uh, of Levantine coastal cities that introduced to the Assyrian elites an entirely new and expanded worldview. And it is through Assyrian sources that we hear of this worldview for the very first time. So now let's move to the uh, third chapter, conceptualizing the Mediterranean in the seventh century, this crucial period, how the unlimited upper sea became a limited inland sea. With Sargon II, already mentioned this Assyrian king, second half of the 8th century BC, a process of structuring the upper sea was initiated that at the end transformed this ocean from an unlimited entity at the edge of the world to a limited and roughly well-defined inland sea with well-defined borders and certain geographical coordinates. All this took place within an ongoing extension of the worldview that again became embedded into the Assyrian claim to rule the world. This extending perspective is rather clearly developed in some literary texts and royal inscriptions, all of them originating at the beginning of the 7th century BCE. They are of major importance for the development of a mantle conception that finally resulted in what we call the Mediterranean, let us discuss each of these texts individually. So I start with the text which is called the Saga on Geography. You can see behind, behind me um, <coughs> uh, the text, which I'm going to deal with in some seconds. The so-called Saga on Geography is a literary text that dates either from the time of the near Assyrian king Esarhaddon or Ashurbanipal. So first, let's say roughly first half of the 7th century BCE. <coughs> 
It claims to outline the sphere of authority of the ancient king, Sargon of Agade, so the king of the third millennium. That's its claim. But in fact, reflects the geographical worldview of its time, that is the 7th century BC. In a retrospective review, that uh, the lands are named from that supposedly, supposedly distant past, when he, Sargon of Agade, conquered the land, the entire expanse under the heavens, marked out the borders, and measured out its extent. That's what the, te what, what the text tells us. Here, a universal claim to authority is once again made, which is also integrated into a real and concrete concept of the world. This Mappa Mundi is spread out in symmetric opposition along the two oceans, marking the two ends of the world. So now, this is the text behind me, which you can read with me together. I start. Anaku and Kaptara, the lands across the upper sea, Dilmun and Magan, the lands uh, across the lower sea, and the lands from sunrise to sunset, the sum total of all lands, which Sargon, king of the universe, conquered three times." End of quote. For the first time in Assyrian texts, lands in Akkadian Matatu are mentioned which are situated across uh, Eberti, across the sea, marking the outer limits of the world, over which an Assyrian claim to authority is made, at least indirectly. Apparently, Anaku and Kaptara, so these are the first toponyms in the, in the line you can see behind me, as well as Magan and Anaku, uh, represented regions in the remote distance that could be reached by crossing the sea with ships. This is absolutely clear. The expansion of the Assyrian worldview must have been related to actual first hand experiences based on existing travel and trade routes. I think this is uh, quite reasonable. The identification of at least three of these four regions is rather clear. Kaptara has to be identified with Crete, Magan with Oman, we have, we have already heard, and uh, Tilmun uh, with Bahrain, which is also absolutely clear. Anaku, so the first toponym in the text, is a hapax legomenon, and its, uh, uh, and, and its identification is not clear at all. However, it is attempting to connect it with the Akkadian annaku, which means tin, and to interpret it as tin land, so the land where tin originates and is transported. Tin mines can be found in Anatolia, and this broad ident identification is definitely plausible. Nevertheless, with the new archaeological findings from southern Spain, other identifications become possible as well. Thus, it has not only become apparent that Levantine traders reached southwestern Spain already in the end of the 10th century BCE, but also that local polities existed which flourished due to the new forms of connectivity. These local communities were also specialized in trading with tin via the Atlantic and inland routes towards northwestern Spain, thus establishing a sort of commercial hub. Having these contemporary new long-distance connections in mind, we cannot exclude the possibility that Anaku represented the regions of southern Spain and thus the western end of the Mediterranean. The text itself appears to reinforce this suggestion. If we take the sequence Anaku Kaptara and Dilmun Magan of the two lines as a chiasm, then Kaptara and Dilmun constitute islands, whereas Anaku and Magan represent the outer ends of the upper and lower seas. Since this fits perfectly for Magan in the Persian Gulf, it might also be appropriate for the Mediterranean. If this is accepted, if the Sargon geography already exhibits an awareness of the entire extent of the Mediterranean. Be that as it may, the Sargon geography is an important witness that concepts of the ocean and of lands beyond the oceans, but also regions in the midst of the sea, grew in importance. Again, we are in the first half of the 7th century BCE. 
This also becomes apparent in a chapter which is called Multabil II of the Babylonian Extispi, Extispici series from Ashurbanipal's library in Nineveh. So you have the chapter Multabil II in this Extispiti series from Ashurbanipal's library, um, which doubles the passage of the so-called Chronicle of Early Kings. So we have the, these two texts doubling each other. And then we can read the following. So again, uh, just uh, behind me, um, I, I'm going to read it. If, so it, it originates from an uh, extispici context. Um, if the liver is like a lion's head, and then omen of Sargon, who by this omen rose in the reign of Ishtar, and had neither rival nor equal, who poured out his splendor on all lands, who crossed the sea in the west, and in his third year conquered the West to its farthest reaches, who established his authority and put up his statues in the West, who made their booty cross the sea on rafts." End of quote. The text appears to play with the double identity of Sargon, that is Sargon of Agade of the third millennium, but also Sargon II, the Neo-Syrian king in the eighth, in eighth century BC, mirroring his famous ancestor. Therefore, it hints to the paradigm of the world ruler par excellence. Interestingly for us, the focus of the text is on the West. It is in this part of the world where the king crossed the sea and conquered regions to its farthest reaches, Adikitishu in Akkadian. There he erected his statues, his stilis. From there he received tribute. The notion that this has been accomplished via rafts deserves special attention, since the idea that the sea becomes shallow at the end of the world is very well attested. Therefore, this is a further reference to the extreme remoteness of these regions. As we have seen, the ocean gradually lost its character as an infinite border zone, but became a region that could be traveled along and with limits of its own. However, so far, these limits were described only in a very vague manner. This brings us to a further step in the development of the idea of the Mediterranean as a structured unit of its own, which we encounter in an inscription of the Neo-Assyrian king Esarhaddon. So this is the text of Esarhaddon, so uh, first half of the 7th century BCE. In an inscription of this king, the conception of the Mediterranean appears for the first time in world history. So I'm um, um, uh, going to read the text again, which all of you can see. I wrote to all of the kings who are in the midst of the sea, from Yadnana and Yavan to Tarsisi, and they bowed down at my feet. I received their heavy tribute, I achieved victory over the rulers of the four quarters." End of quote. The text passage contains several peculiarities that further develop traditional, traditional concepts towards a new understanding of space. The directly preceding section had documented the subjugation not only of the entire Levantine coast, including Egypt, but also of the desert regions situated in the southeast of the Arabian Peninsula, the Persian Gulf, and the mountainous border regions of Uartu, modern uh, Armenia, in the northeast. By referring to the four quarters of the world, it becomes obvious that world domination is the issue at stake. However, the way in which this fact is expressed is of critical importance and hints at innovative concepts towards structuring space. For the first time, the expression in the midst of the sea is linked neither to a toponym nor an ethnonym. It stands on its own as a sui generis geographical designation. Moreover, the term upper sea is not applied anymore in this context. For what Esarhaddon is talking about is at first hand not a liminal border zone anymore, but a newly defined geographical space. This becomes evident from two structural elements of the passage. First, as always in Neo-Assyrian royal inscriptions, 
an expanded worldview is combined with the claim to hold sway over the entire world. Therefore, the midst of the sea is related to an, uh, to an anonymous mass of kings. These kings are by no means to be understood as a summarizing reference to the list presented just previously in the text, for the issue here is exclusively the expanded world perspective and thus the space which lies beyond the directly controlled Levantine coast. Second, this space is described by geographical boundaries using three terms, of which one was well known, which is Yadnana, uh, one used sparingly, which is Yavan, and one unknown in Neo-Assyrian royal inscriptions until that point, which is Tarsisi. Yadnana, Cyprus, had been connected with the location in the midst of the sea since the days of Sargon II, as we have already heard, in which context it represented a marker of the outer limits. For Yavan, however, this only applied to a limited, to a limited extent in earlier testimonies, it was not the toponym, but rather the ethnonym, Yamnaya, that was localized as being in the midst of the sea, which constituted a paraphrasing of an indefinite remoteness suggesting the edge of the world, and generally translated as Greeks. With the appearance in the Assyrian annals of the toponym Yavan, which until then had only surfaced in Assyrian bureaucratic documents, the region from which the Yamnaya, the Greeks, originated is defined more precisely for the first time. However, this is only made possible by the fact that this area no longer functioned as a synonym for the edge of the world. This outer limit is instead expressed by a new toponym which is written Tarsisi and is linguistically to be realized as Tarshishi. This location has nothing at all to do with Tarsos in Cilicia, but is to be connected instead with the biblical Tarshij, and is obviously related to Tardesos, which appears in the Greek sources from the 6th and 5th century BC onwards. This refers to a region which was located in the vicinity of Uelva Cadiz, and which was in contact with the Phoenician cities of the Levantine coast from the end of the 10th century BC onwards at the latest. It was in this very regions where Greeks localized the Pillars of Hercules, probably referring to a place related to the Tyrian god Melkart. Shrines of Hercules Melkart also marked the conceptualized outer ends of other oceans, perceived as inland seas, as for example has just recently become obvious for the southern end of the Red Sea. Where, where, um, uh, a Roman inscription originating from the Pharasan Islands uh, calls this southern part of the Red Sea as Pontus Hercules. So from this it becomes apparent that Tarshishi refers to the outer limits of what we nowadays dub the Mediterranean. The three toponyms, Yadnana, Yavan and Tarshishi, thus denote a coordinate system which for the first time spanned the entire Mediterranean region the construction of which reveals the viewpoint as being ori oriented from east to west. Of the three vertices of this coordinate system, the easternmost two, Yadnana and Yavan, had already been connected with the midst of the sea, and thus with far distance by the earlier tradition. The image captured with this metaphor was now stretched further to the west, reaching its most extensive dimension at this point, which is Tarshishi. The phrase now referred not simply to the position of Yadnana, Yavan, or even Tarshishi, but rather to the space marked out by these points and which is to be equated with our Mediterranean Sea today. This space was still vast, but not infinite anymore. With this extension, the Assyrian Western orientation reached its maximum point of expansion. It was for the first time in history that the mantle concept of the Mediterranean evolved, however, without giving it yet a specific name. This new idea of an ocean with its eastern and western limits was even more substantiated by a third source, 
that completes the picture which we have so far been reconstructing. And this is the Itana epic, which um, the, the text I'm going to deal with in a second. The famous epic about the hero Etana and his adventurous journey came down to us in different versions. Apart from an old Babylonian and middle Babylonian Assyrian representative, so second millennium BC, we also possess a new Assyrian version, so for our times now, first millennium, of the text that originates from Ashurbanipal's library in Nineveh. It is only in this late version, only in this one, not in the earlier one, where a passage is preserved that is of utmost interest for our concerns. This mythical, legendary king Etana, king of Kish, and the first king after the deluge, so in this story, is riding on the back of an eagle up into lofty heights. So the back of the eagle up into the heights. The higher he soars, the more he gains a completely new perspective of the world. Seen through the lens of mental mapping, this perspective represents an innovative and very recent view of the world as it has been conceptualized just at the very time when the text was written down. It is a worldview that for the first time adequately includes the very recent exploration of the West and again, a vol à lettre, yields a perfect characterization of the Mediterranean as an inland sea. When moving up into the sky, higher and higher, the eagles invites Etana three times to look down on the shrinking world and describe what he sees. So, and this is now the text which I'm going to read, the coastal passage. He, this is the eagle, bore him aloft one league. Look, my friend, how the land is now. The people of the land murmur like flies, and the wide sea is like a cattle pen or like a courtyard, probably. He bore him aloft a second league. Look, my friend, how the land is now. The land became a patch or a garden, you can also translate. And the white sea is like a, a, a trough a, or a bucket. He bore him aloft a third league. Look, my friend, how the land is now. I am looking down, but I cannot see the land anymore. And my eyes cannot recognize anymore the white sea. End of quote. The pictures and conceptions of Etana's worldview are enlightening. After one league, he cannot understand anymore what the people are talking about due to the large distance. What he gets is just an unidentifiable sound of noise. In general, one could discuss whether what Etana sees is the Mediterranean or the Persian Gulf. However, embedded into the contemporary contexts of the explorations as well as the new and innovative perceptions of the West, it is much more plausible that the passage refers to the Mediterranean. According to this text, this sea is not a circular ocean surrounding the world, but structured, I quote again, like a cattle pen. So here you have um, the, the crucial terminology. He, it, it is structured like a cattle pen. The uh, White Sea, Tamta Rabashtu, Mala Tarpatsu. It is still vast, Rabashtu, but it has become an inland sea, clearly delimited and obviously surrounded by land. This conception even becomes more apparent after Etana and the eagle reach the second league. So higher up, the land is transferred into a garden, into a patch, Muzaru in Akkadian. And the sea has by now become a trough, a buginu in Akkadian. The conception of the Mediterranean as an inland sea couldn't have been expressed metaphorically in a better way. The passage is an outstanding witness of the expanding worldview of the 7th century BCE and the very recent awareness that the Mediterranean Sea has become a basin surrounded by land. Such a view is, of course, only possible when Levantine mariners, our Phoenicians, had already reached as far west as the Straits of Gibraltar. As we have just seen, this was the case indeed. With this, the concept of the Mediterranean was born, although the newly conceptualized ocean had not yet received a distinctive name of its own. This can be explained in two ways. On the one hand, this might only be due to a silence of our sources. A new term might have been introduced, but we do not hear about it in our available sources. This is, at least in my opinion, not very likely, since as we have already seen, 
ancient Near Eastern sources continue to, to talk in an unspecific way about the sea or the midst of the sea. On the other hand, the term sea, ocean, or its assumed Phoenician equivalent, Great Sea, just remained in use, although the conceptions and ideas about this ocean were now much more precise and developed uh, than they uh, much more developed than they used to be in earlier times. It is also very likely that this specific and new Mediterranean perspective was especially Levantine and thus Near Eastern. Not coincidentally, this perspective appears to have been conceptualized along the Phoenician exploration of the West, where the East-West oriented idea of an inland sea perfectly fits in. So when Greeks, like Hecateus, started to speak about the Great Sea or Our Sea, they may have borrowed the unspecific Levantine terminology. And this was, of course, already observed by modern scholarship. Nevertheless, their conception of the sea was somehow different, since with the Aegean in the center, their idea of the sea appears to have included the Black Sea from very early onwards. According to Herodotus, only the Caspian Sea was an inland sea. Apart from this, there were only three remaining great seas and all of them were interconnected. The sea, quote, where the Greeks sail, the sea beyond the Pillars of Heracles, which they call Atlantic, and the Red Sea. So, first book, chapter 204. It is reasonable to identify the first one, that is the sea whereon the Greeks sail, as the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, which were perceived as one single unit. This immediately leads to the already discussed Greek sources of the 4th century BC that share the very same conception. This appears to have changed only in the second half of the 4th uh, century BC when Aristotle talks about their interior sea. He so Talasa. When the anonymous survey of circumnavigation of the Great Sea, originating probably in Hellenistic times, focuses, focuses on his main topic, that is the Great Sea, Megale Talasa, this has become without any doubt our Mediterranean. However, it was the term the interior sea that the Romans adapted as Mare Internum and Mare Intestinum as Pliny and Florus, for example, testify. You can see again behind me. With the grow growing Roman Empire, this sea rapidly became a mare nostrum, a term attested for the first time with Caesar in Bella, Bellum Gallicum, fifth book. When it started to perfectly define a world ruled by the newly established Roman Empire, this inland sea was still not called Mediterranean since it took until the very end of antiquity, when the term Mare Mediterraneum was introduced for the first time with the Isidorus, as you can also see uh, behind me. Thus, although terminology appears always to have been somehow fluid and unspecific, and that's my point, it was during the evolving Roman Empire when the concept of the Mediterranean as an inland sea and as a unit per se became fashionable in our classical sources. In any case, this idea perfectly defined the extension and reach of Roman rule. However, as we have already seen, the concept was considerably older and reached back until the beginning of the first millennium BCE. It was the beginning of the Iron Age when the idea of the Mediterranean as an inland sea evolved for the first time, and it were Levantine mariners who developed this concept, which has become a fair component of our world flow. Worldview. So let's conclude. Until the late 8th century BCE, ancient Eastern sources conceptualized the Mediterranean primarily as the Upper Sea that marked an unlimited border zone of the world towards the West. This mental map changed considerably from the time of Sargon II onwards, so late 8th century BC. Although the main agents of this change originated from Levantine cities like Tyre, that started to penetrate the Mediterranean in its entire extent, it is cuneiform sources from the Near Assyrian period 
that are our major first-hand witnesses for these changing mental configurations of maritime space. With Esa Haddon, beginning of the 7th century BC, the mental system of coordinates was expanded for the first time as far west as the Straits of Gibraltar, when the regions of Tarshishi represented a new border marker of the far west. This toponym has to be equated with the biblical Tarshish and the Tardesos of the classical sources and refers to a region around Huelva, Cadiz and the Guadalquivir in southern Spain. Already in the 9th century BC, if not earlier, Levantine mariners started to explore these outer limits of a newly conceptualized maritime space. With the subjugation of the Levantine cities by the near Assyrian Empire, the Assyrians made this new geographical worldview their own. Thereby, for the first time in history, the Mediterranean was perceived as an inland sea and as a unity of its very own. Thank you very much for your attention.